like messes up the roads and that work. So getting the roads you know, crisscross and cut my green infrastructure. So we have to find a way we could resolve this and back to the idea of the, of the water, the grey water. And for the black water, you bring it out of the bottom back to the ground in a natural way and using using uh, using constructed wetlands. So these are biases to bring water back to the ground. And then for, for the uh, constructed wetland, um, this is a constructed wetland, it's a space of ponds. That is a natural way for treating black water. So the water goes from one side to the other side, but it reaches the end. Uh, it is uh, almost portable, about 6.5 meters. It leaves all the buildings, it's covered. Here you can put one building, another building without getting wet. And then within this area, the pathway, which of course we have the, uh, the path walk. And these are different ways of bringing things up from the ground up to uh, stairs and escalators, plus stairs, escalators, and you know, elevators for stairs and elevators space below. This is the top view of this properties of the uh, these are the big these are very evil which is our uh, this location. So in this way our vegetation continuously not within this site, the job set aside. This is the distance site and we bring all these together um, to this network of pedestrian patterns. Now we start to look at the built environment, how about engineering? And this is the scheme for digital a data set for scanning them, scanning them the company. And this time we looked at the waste for the start, goes around to the other side, goes down to the back, to the front again, it comes back again in, in, in a continuous uh, route uh, to the whole site. Because computers is so important, because the nature of the fertilizers and nutrients. The atrium for this, uh, the entry block, the, um, the, the lift block is actually isolated, and on the top to give the power to this, we put, we put uh, a photovoltaic series of water for the water panels, and this is the energy for the use of this building, 150 hours per square meter per hour, compared to the typical of this building, uh, which is not that satisfactory. Uh, this is the uh, emission reduction. So now designing a low energy building that is part of the technology that we do. Now let's say we have a chance of climate, you have a very cold winter and a very hot summer, and in between you have two very nice little seasons swimming water. And so, green design for me starts with passive mode. Then we try to shake the building, try to orientate the building, try to get to the start of the building. And in this way, we, we can see the top of white water line. We can improve from the conditions a bit more uh, from the outside, but not that, not that, not that much. What we should try and do is to start with using renewable energy sources so that we can, we are not dependent on full mode systems. That's an existence in all the different kind of less between the cheap, different achieve uh, with, uh, with most buildings. Mm -hmm. if you look at the position, uh, one that I think uh, we are blessed to have because I think knowing better will mean we will act better. So, um, Sanjay, thank you for joining us. I know it was a very last minute thing, but you've been very gracious and kind to accept this and, and have this conversation with me. I hope to discover a lot through you, and I hope that some of the people seated here will understand why I do what I'm doing <laughs> relentlessly. Yes, actually, I had to cancel something, but anyway. Uh, Aren't you so happy? You had to cancel it? You get yeah. to talk to me, Sanjay. I'm very happy. <laughs> Good. <laughs> why do you think I cancelled it? <laughs> So I was told that you couldn't have this conversation. And then you sent across. That was brilliant. You know, those uh, the iPads moving and the words across. So the message there was that recycling is really important. And she's actually, you know, there's so many causes that she's fighting for that it's really interesting to know. And then I found out that her father's not. That's true. I grew up amidst models. Not the variety that I eventually became. But <laughs> the ones that everybody in this room knows really well. Sandpapering furniture, understanding design. And uh, I actually have to share something very personal with you today, which I think will put into perspective my need to do what I do and to use the opportunity of the platform that life has provided me with, which is communication, to help improve people's awareness 
about climate change, about the need for sustainability, and create an environment of harmony and balance. Um, my father didn't want to have a child. He had decided over 30, 35 years ago that he would not produce a child because he believed that the world was going to hell and that he thought it was unfair to bring an innocent being into a world in which I would like to bring an innocent being into. And especially because I'm an urban dweller, I live in a city, I can't afford to up and leave to mountains or to a greener environment that would have cleaner air and cleaner water. But I live here in the midst of a concrete. I hate to use the word jungle because jungles are so beautiful. I don't know why concrete uh, uh, spaces are called jungles. Because they don't really reflect the truth that the jungle does. Uh, and that one unifying truth is that every living being is connected. So I can't up and leave. I'm living here. I have to deal with the serious threat that I think every urban dweller is dealing with, which is the risk to health, the risk to life, and the risk to progress in, its, in, in our truest sense. And I hope that our conversation here today, Sanjay, will give us the opportunity to explore how better, how much better can we do, and why it's important for us to do better. I really want to discover some of the challenges that you face as an architect in convincing people why it's important and pertinent to create an ecological balance in development, in the, the living spaces that you create for people. Um, because I think that what becomes very, very evident every time there is any kind of discourse on environmental conservation or finding a balance or when de development is discussed, people say there will always be collateral damage. Trees will be cut for roads to get built. That is the collateral damage. Um, and it's always a conversation between them and us. Uh, government bodies perceive environmentalists as them. They're the bad guys. They are the, you know, the span of the wheel. Loss of life, loss of health, uh, degeneration, and the rest. Uh, and I think, and this comes from a lack of awareness and a lack of understanding. So please tell me, as somebody who has won so many awards for the extraordinary work you've done, you've gone to so many places, you've done such amazing work, what is the one challenge that you always face in convincing the people that you're doing projects for that what you want to do is the right thing to do? That's, um, we were just discussing this earlier. You know, when in an architectural project, if 100% is about doing the project right, 5% is doing 1,000 acres to 111,000 acres. I mean, that's huge. So what's happening is Pune used to be this little city that people used to travel three and a half hours to go. But now if you leave Bombay and you go towards Pune, it's almost like you haven't left the city. Because there's, except for the little mountain in the middle, which you have to cross, Bombay has extended all the way, Pune has extended all the way. In the process, all the natural resources have been removed. And convincing a developer to create landscape spaces that are required have you ever told somebody not task. to build here? That you should not be building here. Have I you have. Something? I have. You know, sometimes the site is so beautiful, you, you don't want to build anything there. But coming back to that, you know, so most developing countries, the most developed countries, have a lot of work which is done by the government, and they do the master plans, and then there are portions and parts. Profit, which is essentially short term yes. money. Yes. Right, but not long-term sustainability, and that is also of their own life True. and livelihood. Mm. You know, just once, you know, usme mere ko kya fayda hoga? You know, aapne to aise kar diya, but usme mere ko kya fayda hoga? And I want, you know, vastu correct is more important for me than orienting the windows northwards. But why should the windows be northwards? Because I'm yes. just breaking it down for people who don't understand this to understand right. it better. Because uh, throughout. <laughs> The, uh, look at, place. Absolutely, look at BKC, look at Gulgaon Meroli, everywhere in India, this wrap around glass, 
Why do you need it? It's wrong. It's completely wrong. You know, I, it brings me to a very, very valid thing that I think we should ask of ourselves, given that uh, I'm surrounded by a community that is going to be responsible for building a lot more. Um, I was in, in West Bengal uh, earlier this year, and I visited the Santhal village. And these are indigenous people, they've been living there for hundreds of years. They have the most sustainable way of living. They live in earthen homes, and um, architects from across the world come to study their architecture on how they build and they live. And um, they were, I was talking to the locals living there, and uh, they were telling me how people from Sweden, from Denmark, from other parts of the world were coming and meeting them and actually taking their artisans away to create the homes that they had built there. Now, in the name of progress and urbanization, what they are threatened with is urban monsters, which is modern buildings coming up in their areas, destroying the natural way of building, uh, which these people have carried forward through possibly centuries of knowledge. And I, I find that this is becoming glaringly evident in practically every state. If we look at the way the Chetanars build their homes, or we look at the way the Rajasthani architecture is done, or we look at, so historically, we have had knowledge about how to build. Cool, cooler naturally, what materials are more earth friendly, more environment friendly, reduce consumption of power and energy. Uh, because these, this kind of architecture was developed at a time when there was no air conditioning and there was, you know, there was no central cooling. Uh, but these homes were naturally much cooler. Uh, what, what can we do about, because glass buildings are considered cool or fashionable or uh, uh, yeah, it's really a perception game, right? Because uh, uh, people don't believe that a, metrop a metropolis can, be, can qualify as one if we don't have a certain kind of architecture in it. Uh, and we, we kind of are dropping our ancient knowledge, we're dropping our, our existing knowledge and embracing styles that aren't relevant, are not sustainable and are not manageable as well and thereby improve, increasing our consumption and waste and all of that. What would you say around that? Absolutely right. Walk bare feet on the floor and you, it would actually, in the peak of summer, give you a thandak in the feet, which nobody uses anymore. Very few people know. Yeah, we were doing that now where we told the client that we'll have Being one. all of the school again. How can we convince new developers, new builders, uh, governments, people, that being true to tradition we and need people implementing like you. that. Sorry? We need people like you. <laughs> yeah, because in India, people take <laughs> this message across your community and, and really push it through. Because it, it is all about awareness. If architects talk, you know, it's not going to be heard, except by other architects. So you need to do it. Done. I shall use my next next opportunity of communication to highlight this. But um, it's, isn't it, isn't this thought, doesn't this thought then extend itself to many other aspects that create a gap between what is sustainable, what is good, uh, and what is important? What do you think causes a gap? I believe it's a lack of awareness. Lack of awareness is what causes the gaps. Mm. And a false sense of development or progress? Aping no. the Western world? Completely. So, you got Mr. Manish Srivastava, Head Marketing, Central Bank, India, Glass Business, to kindly come on stage and present the uh, Sanjay with a memento as a token of our appreciation. They need a photograph. 
And I think they want to improve photographs too. summit is I think one of the most pertinent conversations we need to have and I'm just really grateful to Economic Times for uh, you know hosting this I know that this is not their first year they've had it in the past as well uh, but when we speak of development we speak of urban planning we speak of economic growth it's very very important for us to speak about sustainability for us to speak about climate change and for us to mitigate the gap between government systems policies rules and uh, the value system and the principle with which people are building and trying to grow uh, uh, urban centers because unfortunately what we witness as human beings today especially who inhabit urban development is that there has been a big gap between the two uh, too many rules have been flouted, too many laws have been broken. Uh, there is a conscience, there's a corruption in conscience more than anything else that is leading to degradation in um, the quality of air that we are breathing, uh, the quality of water that we are drinking and it impacts our health, it impacts our lives and we have to collectively make the difference. I think a big, big reason for why uh, we are faced with this problem is because not enough people believe that the consequences of their cho choices, ill choices, is going to impact their lives directly. And uh, the, the, the beauty of this forum is that we don't just highlight how poor choices uh, impact our lives directly, but we also, I think, uh, this platform reinforces the opportunity to innovate to grow, to find solutions to problems, and truly understand what it means in a holistic sense to be a progressing nation in all its value and all its, its glory. So what are some of the major things you would encourage people to do in an effort to create a cleaner, greener planet? I think my biggest, uh, biggest reiteration through my conversation uh, <laughs> with Sanjay Puri was uh, the emphasis on the fact that uh, developers, builders uh, identify a, a very key uh, thought which is that when you're building, when you're developing, whatever it is, what ki whatever kind of infrastructure, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, corporate, whether it's roads, highways, whatever it may be, do it from a place of value, do it from a place of principle, don't just do it for the sake of making money because the consequences of uh, short-sightedness are, are large and we it is essential that we start caring more and becoming more responsible as developers. Lastly, you have been passionate voice for better waste management. Share with us a few thoughts on that. You know, waste management is one of the most critical issues uh, in urban developments. Uh, we seem to forget, even as uh, people who are a part of uh, civil society, that the more we consume, the more we waste. Uh, and everything that we bring home has to go somewhere. Uh, whether it is uh, the things that we buy uh, to use. Uh, so we need to become more conscious as citizens on our consumption and our waste and become more responsible about how we treat our waste. Um, I know that we expect the government to implement better waste management systems, but if cooperative housing societies, schools, hospitals, colleges, universities, canteens, hotels, restaurants do not collectively acknowledge the importance of managing their waste better, then governments will not be able to help us. Because there is only that much that the government can do. We as citizens need to become more proactive about how we manage our waste. And it starts with basics, uh, which is waste segregation. 
dry waste and wet waste all your kitchen waste can go into the soil it is biodegradable it's you know it can be created converted to compost it can be converted to energy but your dry waste can't be and that can be recycled so the collection points for recyclable waste have to increase e waste collection points have to increase i have a young boy called who calls himself earthbud on twitter who's started a phenomenal campaign he's one of us he's a child he's actually a child and he when he uh, when deona dumping ground burning came into the news and we discovered the the chemical uh, component uh, particulate component in that burning ground thing he said one second e waste is being burnt there so our wires our batteries our you know gadgets we're just throwing it and it's landing up on our dumping grounds and it's being set ablaze and all of that in our air means heart disease means cancer means ill health to us so this young boy all of 14 has been conducting workshops in schools in universities encouraging people to collect their e waste through the year and deposit at the right places so uh, working with municipalities working with government working with so it's really about participation and awareness so each of us can and must do our bit Oh, yeah, lastly, if you could just give the New Year wishes and the Christmas for your viewers. Sure, of course. Um, 2016 has been a really tough year for a lot of us and a lot of part of the world. I really pray that 2017 is a peaceful, more peaceful world to live in, is a happier place for all of us to live in, and becomes a place where each of us makes a proactive choice to make a difference and be the difference. So uh, here's wishing all of you a very happy, peaceful, and healthy 2017. May all our collective dreams come true, and may we become the change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay,